You just watched President Trump and Joe Biden go head to head in their second and final debate. Our expert breaks down the most heated moments. Plus, as millions of voters cast their ballots ahead of the election, there are major concerns of fraud. We're going to go in depth on the research surrounding it and reveal just how much it happens. This special edition of ABC 10 News starts now. More than 100 students at Mission Vista High School are forced to quarantine for two weeks after another student tested positive for COVID-19. Good evening, I'm Kimberly Hunt. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of ABC 10 News. And I'm Steve Atkinson. This comes just days after the North County School reopened for in-person learning. Our ABC 10 News reporter Laura Acevedo is joining us now with more on the steps the school is now taking. Laura. Yeah, well, the district says that this positive case happened on Tuesday at Mission Vista High School. Officials say they quickly notified all staff and students that may have had contact with this student. Now, according to the district, roughly 130 students were in the four classes that the student attended on Tuesday. While officials say that student didn't come into close contact with every student that was sent home, the students and staff were sent home for a 14 day quarantine period. School just started in person on Tuesday. Last Thursday, a group of teachers rallied against the district's reopening plan, saying that they thought it was too risky. The district says it's enforcing mask use and cleaning regularly, but their website says that all classrooms will have the normal amount of students and that seating arrangements will be less than six feet apart. This is what one teacher had to say about the reopening plan last Last week. If we can't keep them safe, that it's, it's, it's misguided, it's haphazard, and it's dangerous. And no other district in San Diego County is doing this type of a reckless opening. The district says that they sent home those students as a precaution. Again, not all of them had close contact with this student. They said they sent them home as a precaution since this was their first incident since coming back to school. There is no word yet on how this student is doing and whether or not they have any symptoms. We did reach out trying to interview the superintendent this evening, but so far we have not heard back. Reporting live, Laura Acevedo, ABC 10 News. Laura, thank you. We have some breaking news. Hey, California appeals court just upheld a ruling which states that Uber and Lyft have to classify their drivers as employees, not contractors. The rideshare companies have been fighting the state's 85 gig worker law since it took effect and are heavily endorsing Prop 22 on the November ballot. If passed, that would exempt Uber and Lyft from the law and make any court ruling moot. The companies can also appeal to the state Supreme Court if they choose. Your voice, your vote. The final debate of the 2020 campaign wrapped up just a short time ago. And it was in stark contrast from the first debate in which both candidates interrupted and talked over each other. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez is in Nashville with the highlights. President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden facing off for their second and final debate. 90 minutes focused on six main topics. The first, the coronavirus pandemic, which has killed more than 220,000 Americans. We have a vaccine that's coming. It's ready. It's going to be announced within weeks. Is that a guarantee? Is no, it's not a guarantee, but it will be by the end of the year. This is the same fellow who told you this is going to end by Easter last time. This is the same fellow who told you that, don't worry, we're going to end this by the summer. He has no clear plan. The candidates then moving to more personal attacks. You were getting a lot of money from Russia. They were paying you a lot of money, and they probably still are. I have not taken a penny from any foreign source ever in my life. We learned that this president paid 50 times the tax in China, has a secret bank account with China, does business in China, and in fact is talking about me taking money. His son didn't have a job for a long time. As soon as he became vice president, Barisma, not the best look, not the best reputation in the world. I hear they paid him 183,000 a month. No basis for that. Everybody investigated that. No one said anything he did was wrong in Ukraine. 
This debate a contrast to the last with contentious but far less chaotic exchanges. We have to provide health insurance for people at an affordable rate, and that's what I do. He was now there as vice president for eight years, and it's not like it was 25 years ago. It was three and three quarters. It was just a little while ago, right? Less than four years ago. He didn't do anything. He didn't do it. He wants socialized medicine. He thinks he's running against somebody else. This is the guy who's tried to cut Medicare. And now with the debate behind them, it is the sprint to the finish line. President Trump pledging to hold multiple rallies every day between now and November 3rd. He'll travel to Florida tomorrow, where former President Barack Obama will be this weekend stumping for his former VP. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Nashville. Before that sprint to the finish, joining us now to talk about tonight's debate is Dr. Kira Green with the Center on Policy Initiatives. Dr. Green, let's start with this first of all. A record number of Americans have already voted early, but for those who are still undecided, have not voted yet, how did the changes in this debate format and the civility that took place in this debate compared to the first debate help those voters make up their minds? Well, see, what I would say is that tonight's debate was probably better characterized as being quieter rather than more civil. Uh, they covered a lot more topics because there was better turn taking. And I think voters had an opportunity to hear the clear contrast between these two candidates. Um, but I do think that one of the things that they heard in terms of this lack of civility was the attacks on Hunter Biden. And I think those are really challenging for the president because, frankly, um, they raise questions around his own honesty and ethics. And that's already a challenging space for him. And Biden did seem to have answers for most of those challenges of, uh, regarding his you know, ethics and, and character. So aside from those personal attacks, coronavirus was a major topic tonight. Once again, the president was on the defensive. Joe Biden was pressed to show how he would handle the pandemic if elected. Did any of the two stand out in your mind on this topic? I actually think this is another example of the very clear contrast between them. And really, they're appealing to different aspects of the voters' minds. You know, Trump focused on reopening to avoid the deaths of businesses, and Joe Biden really focused on uh, safer reopening in order to avoid the deaths of individuals. And it's going to be up to voters which one of those arguments really lands with them. We got through a lot of other topics tonight, including international relations, health care, the economy, immigration, a lot more. With this being the last debate, what did each candidate say in relation to one of these topics that helped or hurt their campaign tonight? You know, I think that uh, for each of them, I'm going to focus on something I think really helped them. I think the president actually did a very good job on the issue of climate change. And while there were some of the typical challenges that the president faces, he did in this answer give more details, um, have a greater command of the facts and really focus there to a great extent. So I think that was a strong answer for him. In contrast, I think where Joe Biden stood out was actually his answers around health care. Again, he had very clear answers, and those are real the, you know, the real strong point of his own background, a place that he led in the last administration, and he really came back there with clear ideas about how he would address health care okay. in his administration. I think the winners tonight were the American people. They finally got to hear something. Dr. Kira Green, thank you for your insight. Thank you. The topic of election-related fraud has been in the headlines more than usual this election. President Trump has tweeted about it at least eight times in the past week. ABC 10 News anchor Derek Stahl is going in-depth on the research surrounding voter fraud and just how much it happens. There have been dozens of studies trying to gauge voter fraud over the last few years, and there are essentially two kinds of research. Studies that look at documented cases of voter fraud and studies that try to predict how much fraud might be going undetected. Voter fraud can fall into several categories, including ineligible voting by non-citizens or by felons, or double voting when someone illegally casts more than one ballot. Voter fraud is cheating by the voters themselves, and it's different from other forms of election misconduct. Pam Smith is an advisor to the nonpartisan Verified Voting Foundation. There is an infinitesimal amount of voter fraud where a voter is intentionally doing something fraudulent. A major study in 2007 by the Brennan Center at NYU calculated the rate of voter fraud in three elections in the early 2000s. They put it between three and 25 ten thousandths of a percent. The Conservative Heritage Foundation keeps a database of known cases of voter fraud. It now has 1,298 examples. That was over a period when there were more than a billion legitimate votes cast. But those are the known cases. 
What about cases of fraud that go undetected? This is an area of research called election forensics, where researchers use advanced statistics and artificial intelligence to try to estimate irregularities. One study by researchers at Harvard and Stanford looked at voter registration data in the 2012 election and used algorithms to estimate that the maximum amount of double voting was 0.02%, or one out of every 4,000 ballots. But they also showed that most, if not all, of these possible double votes could have actually been clerical errors. Massive fraud, fraud on any kind of massive scale, as you know, we've heard talked about, that doesn't happen. It's not happening. And there are safeguards, there are guardrails in place to prevent it. Smith says California's guardrails include pre-election testing of voting machines and other equipment and audits after the election. There are other kinds of fraud called election fraud, like the illegal ballot harvesting in North Carolina's 9th district in 2018. But Smith says those cases are actually easier to catch because they typically involve multiple people. And in the very rare cases when they do happen, Judges can order an election redo. Derek Stahl, ABC 10 News. There's an easy way to protect your vote against fraud. You can sign up for the state's Where's My Ballot tool, and you'll get an alert the moment it's received and counted. There is a link on 10news.com. And while early voting is underway, the county is gearing up for Election Day and how to keep people safe while voting in person. At the end of next week, 235 super polling locations will open across the county. Registrar of Voters Michael Vu says they've been working with medical professionals to guide them on the best ways to keep people safe. We'll be offered gloves and masks should they uh, forget to bring their mask. Um, and if they need to uh, can't wear a mask or they refuse to wear a mask, there will be a designated spot outside the voting area for them to cast a ballot. The county has stocked up 800,000 pair of gloves and 300,000 masks for Election Day. Plexiglass will also be set up at the polling places to separate voters from poll workers. And here are the latest numbers on the coronavirus in San Diego County. 235 new cases were reported today. That brings our total to 53,498. And there were three new deaths, bringing that total to 866. Remdesivir is now the first drug in the U.S. to be FDA approved for treating COVID-19. It is made by Gilead Sciences, which has a site in Oceanside. Until now, the, the uh, drug has only been given to hospital patients under an emergency youth authorization. It's helped shorten recovery time about a third for some patients. It was one of the drugs used to treat President Trump. County officials are urging everyone to get a flu shot this year. Over the course of the next few weeks, they will be hosting pop-up clinics across the county. It's designed for those who don't have insurance or those who can't get the vaccine from their health care provider or pharmacy. Dr. Denise Foster, the county's chief nursing officer, says getting the flu vaccine can also help in the battle against the coronavirus. The flu vaccine can actually prevent the flu um, and prevent people from seeking health care um, services that might be needed right now in the midst of the pandemic. The county says more people have gotten a flu shot this year compared to last year, and they hope that trend continues.